in the summer of 2002, certain Catholic theologians captured the attention of many when Alan Cooperman wrote an article for the Washington Post, August 18th, 2002. And he gave forth in that article what was some quite a amazing news. I quote that article. A committee of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has negated, that's negated, the death of Christ and invalidated his declaration, you must be born again, John 3, 3 through 7. Campaigns that target Jews for conversion to Christianity, quote, are no longer theologically acceptable, acceptable in the Catholic Church, unquote. A committee of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has declared. Summing up a series of Vatican pronouncements since 1965 that has reversed the church's historical approach to Judaism. The bishop said last week that the Old Testament covenant between the Jews and God is valid and that Jews do not need to convert to Christianity to be saved. While the Roman Catholic Church, quote, must bear witness in the world to the good news of Christ, this evangelizing task no longer includes the wish to absorb the Jewish faith into Christianity and so end the distinctive witness of Jews to God in human history, unquote, they said. Eugene Fisher, director of Catholic Jewish Relations for the Bishops' Conference, said the document contains, quote, no new doctrine, unquote, but, quote, distills a lot of things that have been said and steps that have been taken, unquote. Since the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s, Fisher noted, for example, that in the 1970s, the church changed its official prayer for the Jewish people, which used to call for their conversion. Now the prayer, recited on Good Friday, asked God to help Jews intensify their faith in their covenant, he said. While the Southern Baptist Convention and other evangelical groups run campaigns to convert Jews, the Catholic Church gradually has abandoned such efforts. And I quote again here, if an individual Jew wants to convert to Catholicism, that can still happen, unquote, said Monsignor Francis Maniscalco, spokesman for the Bishops' Conference. And I quote again, but the point is that proselytizing campaigns are not compatible with the respect with which we hold Judaism. Going ahead, the document makes clear that this attitude is unique, and I quote again, though the Catholic Church respects all religious traditions, and though we believe God's infinite grace is surely available to believers of other faiths, it is only about Israel's covenant that the church can speak with certainty of biblical witness, unquote, it says. Then the last, although he played no role in drafting the document, Rabbi Arnold Risnikoff, director of interreligious affairs for the American Jewish Committee, hailed it as, quote, groundbreaking, unquote. Some Catholic leaders have renounced proselytizing among Jews in the past. But, quote, this is the first time the Catholic leaders of a whole country have stated it officially, unquote, he said. I wondered how many of you even knew that that was the Roman Catholic position because that was back in 2002, 20 years ago. But now I've said all along, and you knew this, and we had a debate with Dr. Callum of the Roman Catholic Church over this very point, that the Bible only is the only rule of faith and practice. But he doesn't believe that because he's Roman Catholic, and Roman Catholic doctrine says it's the Bible plus, plus the magisterium, which is the teaching arm of the Roman Catholic Church, 
that is binding. So when you see this U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and they are approved by the Pope and all that is in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church that needs to approve such things, when they gather in their official dumb as they did 20 years ago and come to that conclusion, then that's the teaching arm, the other authority besides the Bible that has ruled on the matter, and so that's the way it is. And that's what we need to understand when I say and have said so many times that the devil must get you away from the Bible as the final rule of faith and practice, the inspired Word of God, in order to cause you to lose your soul. How he does that is multifaceted. There's every kind of doctrine under the sun. But this is typical of Roman Catholicism because they still believe the Pope and all of the official councils, which involves the cardinals and archbishops and so forth, and bishops, that when they convene officially, then the Holy Spirit's there. And when they draw a conclusion, that's just like Paul being inspired of the Spirit to write the book of Galatians or Peter to write what he wrote, or John to write what he wrote. That's what they believe. That's why we had a debate with them, and that's why they debated us. So what I'm trying to get us to understand here now is that, uh, Ken, you don't need to teach the book of Hebrews anymore because that's simply saying that, no, you must believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth to be saved, and you must abide in the new covenant of Christ. Uh, I don't know how it is that uh, people can get themselves so bound up in these things, but when they start down the track to where you can make up your mind as a mere human being what's going to be the standard of right and wrong, there's no end to it. There's no end to what they may do. Now, really, this is in keeping with what the Roman Catholics have done for hundreds of years. You may not know it, but it was only as, as late as 1870 that they got together and decided the Pope was infallible. Well, they had a Pope all the way back to, what was it, six-something? But he wasn't infallible. He was considered by the Western Church, European churches basically, to be the Prince of the Apostles because they thought Peter was, and they think the Pope, is in the office of St. Peter. But the church itself, Roman Catholic, or just Catholic church as it was known then, Catholic meaning universal, divided at about 1100 and something because they demanded that the Pope be the one to have the supreme authority. They had not yet de declared his infallibility. And the Eastern churches didn't like that. They split off from them, and thus there's where your Eastern Orthodox Church comes from. And I noticed just recently that the Pope in Rome had said of the chief patriarch of the Orthodox, who is Russian Orthodox in this case, over this matter of Russia's invasion of um, Ukraine, that the Pope in Rome had said he hoped that whatever the name of this Archbishop, what he read, patriarch in uh, Moscow, that he wouldn't become Putin's altar boy. Well, that really upset the patriarch. And his remark was, well, if we're going to have unity, then we can't have that kind of comment coming from anybody. But the whole mess is a, a, a paper tiger when it comes to being anything truthful, anything you ought to listen to. None of them have the Word of God behind what they're doing, and they don't think they have to. They write the Word of God, and the Roman Catholic Church has for a long time said, we gave you the Bible. No, they didn't. They're not the original church. They grew out of an apostasy. The church was already falling away, and they, out of that falling away, developed into what they are today. And as I said earlier, they have, along over a period of many, many years, added things to their doctrine. All of these things didn't just happen overnight. Sometimes there were several hundred years 
went by for hundreds of years. They did not use a mechanical instrument of music in the worship. None of them did. Then it was introduced, but people weren't ready for it, and they kicked it out. Another hundred years or so thereabouts went by, and they accepted it and finally got it in. And if you go into any of the old cathedrals that date back over a thousand years, as far as instrumental music is concerned, you will see the uh, loft that has to do with putting in that big organ, which is a big pipe organ. And it always looks out of place for the architecture. And there's a reason for that. That building wasn't built to have that thing put in. It was put in hundreds of years after they did this. It's not by accident that a cappella means singing according to the chapel. And they did not use mechanical instruments of music. But see, for us today, they've used it so long, we think, well, it's always been that way. No, it was added just like this was 20 years ago. It was added hundreds and hundreds of years ago, along with all sorts, holy water, holy orders, all those things. Well, you can do that if you decide the clergy, the hierarchy, the governing body of the Roman Catholic Church determines, because the Holy Spirit's there talking to them, what's right or wrong. And they claim to do that because it keeps the church up to date. So they can say, yes, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's the Word of God. But we have to keep everything up to date. Do you remember Dr. Callum saying he loved the Roman Catholic Church because it was so large? His words. He didn't mean in number. He meant because it embraces so much. If you basically believe in the seven sacraments, you can believe all sorts of other things that contradict each other, but they're going to accept you in. You can have a Pentecostal Roman Catholic Church. You can have all sorts of things. And they do. They have all sorts of different beliefs among them. But the fundamental lease that makes Roman Catholicism, Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism never changes. Now, with all of that in mind, let's go back to what they said they changed here. You would do away, actually, with the whole New Testament. Oh, but you'd do away with more than that. You'd do away with all the prophecies concerning Christ. How in the world would you uphold what he said in Isaiah chapter 53 concerning what the suffering uh, servant would accomplish by suffering and death? It would just simply make null and void all of it. And thus, he, writer of Hebrews wouldn't have had anything to say he, unless they say we've got to update the writer of Hebrews. In effect, that's what they're saying because the bishops all put themselves on a par with every inspired writer of the New Testament. So why would there need to be Paul saying that the law of Moses, as long as it's standing, is a barrier that's erected to separate Jew and Gentile? They just declared that it's all right for that barrier, that covenant, as the Jews live, acknowledging it, for it to continue to exist. Well, Paul had this to say. He says in verse 13 of Colossians 2, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, speaking, of course, to Gentiles, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, that's Christ, having forgiven you all your trespasses. And here's what he did, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Well, if that's the truth, what those guys did in, uh, in 2002, they reinstated it. <laughs> what Christ took away when he nailed it to the cross, they said, no, it's all right. You can still get to heaven by following that which Christ nailed to the cross. But you see, this kind of argument means nothing to them because they don't believe that anybody has a right to conclude what they did and like things in this article unless you are one of the bishops or in an official capacity of the teaching arm of Roman Catholic doctrine. That's how they do it. And all they expect you to do is a good, faithful Roman Catholic is do as you told. Now, did we run across that last week with the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses? Didn't they, didn't they tell us that they get together at least once a week as a body and study the Scriptures and they're open to the Holy Spirit, settling it so they can all be the same mind? So I don't know how they determine when they've got the black and white Scriptures right there before them 
what, how, how, does it, how does the Holy Spirit move among all those men to get them all on the right track? But that's what he said. So then the only proper disseminating arm of truth is the Watchtower Society and what they print. So you can't understand the Bible if you don't have that which is printed by the Watchtower Society. Well, you can't understand, according to Catholics, what the Bible says or what you need to do unless you have the clergy telling you, the magisterium as they call it the teaching arm of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, if you just begin to take their conclusion, look at all of the things, if you go back and actually said, well, the Holy Spirit got them, they said that, that's the truth. Look at all the stuff you would have to remove from your Bible. Uh, I understood from Colossians 2, 13 through 14 that in order for the Gentiles to be saved, the ordinances that separated the Gentiles had to be canceled. I think you've heard that word cancel once today. If the first covenant remained standing, that would be the law of Moses. Then the Jews who convert to Christianity, according to Paul's own reasoning, Romans 7, 1 through 4, will be committing spiritual adultery. That's where Paul points out that if you marry and you have a living mate, under normal circumstances, you go out and marry somebody else, you committed adultery. His point there was, but when a mate dies, you're set free from that. And you can go marry another who's eligible for marriage. And Paul is doing all of that, trying to make it clear that you're freed from that law when it's been taken out of the way. And you're free then under the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Also, it's interesting, and uh, Ken hadn't got to that yet, but he will. In Hebrews 9 and verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, what is his reasoning there? That's set into a passage where the context is his reasoning that the law's done all the law was ever meant to do. And it's been removed according to Colossians 2.14. And therefore, if it's still standing, you don't have what we all do have through obedience to the New Testament salvation in Christ. Christ can't even be our high priest, Hebrews 7.11.14. Because if the law of Moses is still in effect, where did the priest come from? Tribe of Levi. Where does the high priest come from? Family of Aaron. Well, Christ can't be a high priest if you say, you Jews get on up there just by obeying the law of Moses. And next of all, the Jews can't today obey the law of Moses. They can obey some of it. They can't obey that part that talks about going into the temple and what they had to do there and all those things, the sacrifices that were offered and the priests that did them and all of those. They don't know where the priesthood comes from. They don't know what tribe they're from. Therefore, there can't be any temple worship. Even if there was a temple over there built just like Solomon's, they couldn't worship there because they don't know where the priestly tribe is. They don't know whether they're of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Bucknesnort. They don't have any idea. They have no idea whatsoever. So it's ridiculous for the Catholics to say this. What they're actually saying is if they give a nod toward heaven and they're believing the same God we are, then leave them alone. That's pretty close to saying it doesn't really make you make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. It makes pretty much universal salvation. God is so loving and so gracious that he'll end up not causing anybody to be lost. And that's universal it's Unitarianism. So we could go on down through here just showing all the things that are implied by them declaring that you can't say a Jew's lost because he doesn't believe in Christ. But if you read, I suggest you jot these down if you want to take note of them later, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 17, you'll see that Paul lied then about the matter of, of the necessity of believing in Christ. In Paul's apostolic judgment, the bishops are the ones who have been bewitched, as he said of the, certain of the Galatians in Galatians 3, 1 through 5. And they've been bewitched for a long, long time. What did it mean then when Jesus himself said to the Jews of which in the flesh he was one, 
except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Does that not apply anymore? Well, Jews do not believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. Engage one in discussion. they tell you that much. If you get around an old Orthodox Jew, you'll see that there'll be a lot more than that. And it's interesting to read about it because they can't stand it. Now, you've got divisions among the Jews today as you had back then, uh, probably far more liberal things today than ever was of Sadducees and difference in them and the Pharisees. But the point is, none of them believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And the Bible makes it clear, if you don't believe it, you're lost. We as the spiritual body of Christ and the spiritually circumcised, we are the children of Israel if we've obeyed the gospel and are faithful. In fact, you know, this rules out the new birth. Jesus told a Jew, you must be born again. How do these people rise up and declare such a thing as that? Brethren, I want to close on this kind of early because I, all I can do is go back through with things and list and list and list things you already know. But does that not frighten us as to how far you can go in justifying yourself and believing about anything you want to in, in, when you're deceived? Now, it all started with the idea that the clergy... It's continued to speak to keep the church updated, and the Holy Spirit's guiding them, so when they make a declaration, then they fit right alongside the New Testament. And then that's where they go. They actually go to the point to where the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, has guided these bishops to say that Jews who do not believe in Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the incarnate Christ, you don't have to believe that he's the Son of God to be saved. You can be saved even while speaking against him, just holding to what you think. We are our greatest enemies because when we want something so much and we know it's against the truth and everything's pushing us that way, we can figure out a way to deceive ourselves and be lost. Well, I suggest to you that you might keep up with what some of these people believe if for no other reason than to see if you cut loose from the moorings of absolute objective spiritual truth, which is the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular, there is no end to where you will go in religious matters or in what you think is God's will. There is a way. It seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If you're not a Christian today, you're not going to become one if your mind's set on justifying something you can't prove by the Bible. Just because it's long held, you'll never become a Christian. You'll hold whatever it is that you've been taught all along, but you can't prove it by the Bible. How is it you can hold on to something like that, knowing full well the Bible's going to be open and mean on the day of judgment just what it means now, and to be just authoritative as it is now, and be judged out of that book when you know you're not ready to meet your Maker because you know what the Bible says, but you're holding on to something else for some other reason? It doesn't make sense. All who become Christians do so by believing Christ as the Son of God, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. That means whatever we believe, it must be taught in the Scriptures, the New Testament in particular. Once we have believed, we obey the commandment, Acts 17, 30, to repent of our sins, and then we're to confess our faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, and we're to complete our obedience to the Lord by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. That is the plan of salvation to Jew and Gentile. It was first preached to Jews and proselytes at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Those Jews were pricked in their heart by the truth. They saw that he who they thought was a, a, a false teacher was really the Son of God the very Messiah they longed for. They were honest of heart. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, they were told to repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Those that gladly received the word, about 3,000 of them, obeyed the gospel. There's your example. Plain and simple. It's not hard to understand. That's how you become a Christian. There is no other way you can become a Christian. As a child of God, if you have sinned and if it's private, not only to you and God, repent of it. Confess it there. But if your life has brought reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ, then we ask you to confess those sins, having repented of them before the church, we'll pray with you and for you. Let's not deceive ourselves. We look at these folks and say, how did they ever get into this state? Well, we may end up going another route. They went this route. But all of it started in them allowing themselves to be deceived because they didn't hunger and thirst after righteousness. They didn't desire above all things else the truth. But Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.